everyone, good evening. It's great to have you at the University of Washington. My name is Paul Rucker. I'm the Executive Director of the University of Washington Alumni Association, and it's wonderful to have you on campus for tonight's lecture, our 2011 series, Reengineering Aerospace. Tonight's series is presented in partnership between the College of Engineering and the UW Alumni Association, and it's wonderful to have all of you here this evening. The UW Alumni Association, for more than 120 years, has worked to build a stronger University of Washington community and our partnership with the College of Engineering, our opportunities to bring back graduates and friends to the university to find out about what's happening in the College of Engineering is truly remarkable and we're pleased to have you here this evening. If you are a member of the Alumni Association, I thank you for your support. Membership makes us able to provide the programs and services to members and to friends of the university, so thank you to our members. And if you're interested in membership or other efforts by the UW Alumni Association, please join and please look at uwalum.com. I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Our topic delves into the area of renewable energy that many of us may not be familiar with, energy use by the US military and the Department of Defense's plan to assure energy independence. The Department of Defense is the largest energy consumer in the states, consuming more than 5 billion gallons of fuel annually in military operations. The government has set ambitious goals for energy independence, and they're working with organizations like Boeing to meet these goals. Tonight, we'll learn how Boeing is working with the government to repower the military with alternative energy. We're, thr we're thrilled to welcome our speaker, Tim Vinopoul, back to campus. He's built quite an impressive career since he graduated from the College of Engineering in 1991 with a Master of Science in Engineering. Tim is the Director of Environment, Health, and Safety Engineering for Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. In his role, he's responsible for developing the Environmental Footprint Reduction Strategy across programs and services while meeting customer needs. It's now my privilege to welcome Tim Vinopoul. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much. It's good to be back in uh, Kane Hall on campus. Although when I was here, I think most of my time was spent down at Guggenheim or Lowe or more, down at that end of the campus uh, from the engineering standpoint. How many of you were here for Mary Armstrong's presentation two weeks ago? Okay. So Mary gave uh, an overview of Boeing's strategy from an environmental standpoint and, and some description of our operations, our operational footprint, how our factories are trying to save energy and lower our environmental footprint. What I'll do today is give a more focused presentation and uh, probably a little more technical uh, uh, in-depth presentation on, on some of the technologies that we're going to try and help uh, our military customers with. What we're doing is we're, we're seeing increasing interest on the part of our defense customers to uh, reduce their environmental footprint broadly, especially from a standpoint of reducing energy. Energy use, tr energy demand, uh, trying to come up with alternative forms of energy, some that they can uh, uh, generate in situ at the bases where they're located. Uh, the, the top uh, photograph is, for me, a very evocative picture of the Khyber Pass. It's, it's a, a convoy mostly of fuel and water going from Pakistan into Afghanistan. And you can see how vulnerable uh, that convoy is to someone who wants to do bad things to, to, uh, to shut down that, uh, that very fragile and vulnerable route into, into our forward base areas. Um, right now in Afghanistan, they're using about 22 gallons uh, per soldier per day to uh, do basic operations, to generate the power, and, and uh, to support the 5 to 20 pounds of batteries that every dismounted soldier carries around with them uh, to do the operations. Uh, those convoys, about every 24 convoys, we lose a soldier or a Marine. And certainly more folks are lost than that back in Pakistan, whether they're drivers or whether they're Pakistani militia and military. So, Every uh, bit of logistics that we can cut down uh, our demand is very important. The, the statistics that the militaries are quoting right now is for 1% fuel savings in Afghanistan, 
we can redeploy 6,500 soldiers. It takes 6,500 soldiers uh, to protect the convoys for just 1% of the fuel chain that we're, that we're pushing into the country. So just to give you an idea of the, the tremendous amount of, of fuel and water use that we've got to bring to the soldiers that they don't, they don't have there in country. So our focus, there, there's actually, for those of you who are interested in, uh, the Sierra Magazine, July, August issue, did a, good, uh, did a good overview of this specific issue and, and how the military advancements in renewable energy and the energy efficiency is really going to be able to help uh, some commercial side of operations too. So what I'll do is focus today on, on how Boeing can help provide some solutions uh, for our military customers. The next couple charts are from the U.S. Navy, and, and Paul, you gave a good uh, overview of the amount of consumption right now by, uh, by the U.S. government and, and uh, the vast majority of the U.S. government consumption of petroleum, as you can see, is uh, done by the U.S. military. The Navy is about a quarter of that. The Air Force uh, actually consumes most of uh, the U.S. government um, petroleum. And so Naval Aviation and Air Force Aviation are key Boeing customers, and we think we can help them in there. The Secretary of the Navy last year put forward five very aggressive goals. And if, uh, if they can succeed in some of those goals, then that will really help on the, on the commercial side. So you can see uh, he intends to sail the Great Green Fleet, take off of the Great White Fleet from... Uh, um, a century ago uh, to look at uh, using biofuels and hybrid ships uh, to try to increase alternative energy uh, navy-wide. One of the, one of the um, I guess, the least likely groups to embrace being green and being environmentally uh, sensitive is uh, Ford Base from the, from the U.S. Marines. But surprisingly, uh, what they found is that uh, we've got a group of Marines in Afghanistan and, and they were ordered to trial uh, generating their own power at site. So they had little wind farms set up. They had a solar array put out. And what they found was that, first of all, it liberated them from, from um, dependence on uh, that uh, logistics chain of uh, fuel uh, and water because the fuel cells that they were able to use at the Ford base also generates water in addition uh, to electricity. But they also found that the fuel cells and the solar arrays were much quieter than these noisy generators that they had running 24-7 and, and it uh, provided a much safer environment for the soldiers uh, because of, of the quiet nature and they could hear people sneaking up on them and, and they weren't such a target. So, so that group of Marines is now uh, real advocates of starting to generate renewable energy in situ at the Ford bases. And it's spreading, uh, it's spreading across uh, the marine uh, Ford bases. Now, it may not surprise any of you, but, but Boeing is not particularly known as a low-cost provider. Uh, the way we generate value for our customers is by insertion of advanced technologies. That's really what, what Boeing brings to the table for a lot of our customers. We're big enough we're able to uh, draw on a number of different technologies, and so that's how we tend to add value for our customers. So what I'll do today uh, is to go through what, what amounts to a little survey of a number of different technologies that, uh, that we believe will be able to both lower the environmental footprint of the, of, of the military products, but also help increase their energy efficiency. I'll start off with something that's very traditionally Boeing, advanced structures, advanced materials, aerodynamics propulsion. We've got a number of programs that we're looking at that uh, can directly help uh, the services reduce their footprints. The first one really addresses uh, a key difference between the military products and our commercial airplane products. Um, you see here the, uh, a chart showing the remaining life of a number of programs. And, and it was just a couple of years ago that I remember the saying was, the mother of the youngest B-52 pilot has not yet been born. 
So if you can imagine that, now that was a couple years ago, so I think the parents of the youngest B-52 pilot are probably in kindergarten now. But, but they're still planning on getting another 30 to 35 years of life out of the B-52 platforms. And we stopped making B-52s when Eisenhower was president. So, so the way the military uses their products is they keep them going for years and years and years. This is much different than the commercial airliners because I, can you imagine going to fly to California or the East Coast on a 727, let alone a 757, right, or, or a 707? So that's the turnover rate because the efficiency requirement is so high on commercial airlines, they have to keep getting the very latest uh, airline technology to, to put in service. For the military, they keep their platforms going for decades and decades and decades. And so one way we can help them uh, save fuel in their operations is to put, uh, help them with new engines. Now this is a, a study that was done a few years ago when jet fuel was at two bucks a gallon. And you can see that even uh, the 76 B-52s, putting new, more advanced engines on them would save between 50 and 100 million dollars after you paid for all the engineering and the new engines and equipment. So that's one way that we're trying to work with our customers to help them with their platforms. Now, of course, we would prefer to sell them new stuff. And so we're working on a whole variety of new technologies that are not so much evolutionary, but really revolutionary in terms of fuel efficiency. One of those is a blended wing body, which flying, flying wing type of aircraft it isn't that well suited for passenger aircraft. I wouldn't want to be stuck inside the middle of a, of a delta wing fuselage, but, but it's great if you want to carry fuel or cargo. And some of the initial studies, we've got a demonstrator that was flying since 2007, 2008. They're looking at somewhere uh, 25 to 40 percent kind of fuel efficiency improvements. Improvements in, in uh, some emissions and next year we're going to test the X48C demonstrator to, to validate some of the noise uh, assertions that, that we think we can save a lot, a lot of noise on that. That's one, that's one potential uh, product that we're looking at trying to interest our customers in. Another one is one that we're developing on our own funds called Phantom Eye. It's a high uh, altitude long endurance aircraft. You can see the objectives to try and have an aircraft stay on station airborne for 10 days continuously with a, with a ton of payload. Uh, and so far, we've, uh, we've gone through and tested the engines. Uh, we're looking at using hydrogen propulsion, uh, very efficient propulsion for this, uh, for this vehicle, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. So that's, that's another uh, candidate that we're looking at for that kind of uh, mission. And then uh, DARPA has given us a contract to work on uh, a very challenging uh, airplane t that's uh, intended to stay aloft for five years at a time. So let's talk a little bit more about some of those. First one, Phantom Eye, the high altitude long endurance. This, is, uh, this aircraft is down at Edwards Air Force Base right now. We've just completed a series of testing, uh, testing on that aircraft, vibration testing, uh, integration with the propulsion systems. We did a fueling test here a few days ago and within the next couple of mo months we expect first flight uh, of this vehicle from, from Edwards Air Force Base. So you can see it uses liquid, liquid hydrogen for propulsion. It's got cryogenic tanks, high pressure tanks in it uh, that are spin-offs of some of the tankage that we looked at for the shuttle program. Uses a Ford engine right now. Uh, that Ford truck engine with some turbocharging. We'll, we'll see that in just a second. And, uh, and this vehicle will probably get up to four days endurance for, for this vehicle and then the, the follow-ons we hope to get as long as, uh, as 10 days. At a testing facility in the hills of Santa Clarita, north of Los Angeles, Boeing engineers are putting a propeller through its paces. Four, three, two, one. But this is no ordinary propeller. And the aircraft it's for is no ordinary plane. The propeller has a 16-foot diameter and is powered by a hydrogen engine that will take Boeing's Phantom Eye, an unmanned aircraft with a 150-foot wingspan, to 65,000 feet and stay there for up to four days. We're walking before we're running here, and our first phase was to establish those start procedures for the engine. Now that we've got a propeller on, 
our uh, expectation and success criteria for this test is to be able to control engine speed with propeller control for the first time just the way we'll do it in flight. The engine and propeller are attached to what the program calls the iron wing, which is a fancy name for the test stand the engine is attached to. Its purpose is to mimic the interface between the wing and the cell on the actual aircraft. Previous tests on the engine and propeller were done in an altitude chamber, and they performed well, but this is the first time all of the flight hardware is running together, allowing the program to control the engine's RPMs with the propeller the same way it will be done in flight. We learn how the prop and the engine are going to work. We kind of get an expected behavior for how we run it. So we're establishing really how we're going to start this thing up and run it, and the more we become familiar with it, uh, the less stressful it becomes. Stressful because servicing an unmanned aircraft at 65,000 feet is not an option, so the airplane and propulsion system need to work flawlessly. Do a lot of the basic building blocks, understand a lot of the science and the technology because uh, there's going to be little to, uh, it's quite a ways to come back from 65,000 feet if you have a problem. So a lot of key risk reduction activities that are occurring right here. And this is the key really, proving out the uh, the propulsion system and the propeller performance. The hydrogen propulsion system is driven by a modified Ford truck engine. For the iron wing test, it's running the way it would in a car. That's fine at sea level, but it's a different story at 65,000 feet where a three-stage turbocharger comes into play. Here, the turbocharger system isn't working very hard, uh, so it's not even spinning very hard, but as we, when we get on the airplane and we climb up in altitude and the pressure starts to drop, that will put a load on the turbocharger system. They will begin to spin up one stage at a time. And that's what keeps the engine running at the high altitude conditions. Without the turbos, the engine would cough out and, and die for lack of oxygen eventually. While the engines and propellers are tested in California, engineers in St. Louis are testing the air vehicle and its systems before everything is shipped to Edwards Air Force Base in California to prepare for flight testing. So that, that was filmed about a year ago. It's down at Edwards now, and like I said, we've, uh, we've done the fueling tests, vibration tests, uh, ready for taxi tests. So that'll be a, a, an exciting uh, new aircraft that will get airborne here in the next few, next few months. The other uh, aircraft I talked about was this uh, Solar Eagle, the Vulture 2 program contract that we've got from DARPA. You know, when we, when we say something is DARPA hard, it, it typically means that we've set a goal without really knowing that we can achieve the goal, that, that, we've, that, that our, uh, our reach kind of exceeds our grasp. And, and so this uh, aircraft is designed to stay up for, as you can see, for up to five years. We're, the demonstrator that we're building is going to shoot for a month. And uh, about a half a ton payload uh, during the night cycles, because obviously you're not going to follow the sun, you're going to try and... Uh, hover, dwell over an area of interest. We're looking at using regenerative fuel cells, so uh, charge up during the day using the solar cells and then use the, the fuel cell power at night um, to discharge and keep the, the electric, electric motors flying. So this, this uh, first flight we're hoping to get uh, within the next two years, by 2014. And that is a real challenge in very flexible structure, very large structure, coupled with, uh, with the solar cells. So the next area that I want to talk about looks at our aircraft systems today and how we can go to the most efficient method of performing those functions. It's something that the Boeing commercial aircraft folks call the more electric aircraft, uh, more electric airplane uh, program. In the table you can see uh, the kind of activities, kind of functions that we typically perform uh, prior to the 787. Electrical handled the cabin lighting and the avionics and the fuel pumps, but the brakes and the flight controls, the landing gear, that was all handled with, with hydraulics. And, and the engine starts and the de-icing, those were all handled with, uh, with pneumatics. And the challenge with hydraulics and pneumatics is that they take bleed from the engine. They're, they're essentially a parasitic load on the engine. So, so when the commercial airplane guys set themselves a challenge for trying to get the, the 
engine as efficient as possible on the 787. They looked at all the parasitic loads of that, uh, uh, that were being levied traditionally on those engines and tried to reduce them where they could. So on the 787, they tried to reduce the bleed. They added more electric aircraft components. And so you can see they moved a number of the issues like flight controls, uh, like engine start, up to be running electrically instead of hydro hydraulically or pneumatically. So it obviously requires more power. So we've got much bigger generators on the 787 than we, we have on previous aircraft. But, uh, but the engines themselves are running much more efficiently. So from a vision standpoint, what, what the commercial airplane team looks at, you can see pre-787, it was a very traditional, like your home electrical system. You've know, you got one, one set of power inputs. You've got circuit breakers and the relays. You've got one EE bay, and you distribute the power. You've, you do have a generator in the tail, uh, auxiliary power unit, generating excess power or extra power that's needed for the loads. But uh, it's a very centralized, very linear kind of electrical distribution system. On the 8.7, it's much more distributed. Uh, you can see you're generating a whole lot of power uh, with, the, with the engine generators and with the APUs. And they're looking at post-787 even more distributed power, use of fuel cells instead of generators, which will help from a carbon footprint standpoint. And uh, if we can get the fuel cells working well, it's, a, it's more efficient than running an engine that powers a generator that produces electricity. So that's one of the, uh, one of the challenges that the engineers have set uh, for future aircraft is to try to take a look at using fuel cells, do energy scavenging. A couple of weeks ago, someone asked Mary about about uh, energy scavenging and, and waste heat, and that's something that we, we hope to put in, in practice in future aircraft. So this is uh, a direction that we're looking at for future systems. The next topic is logistics and operations and uh, facility management. It's a, it's a little less sexy than, than uh, solar-powered aircraft, but, but it, it can really help and is proven to help uh, today's environment and today's systems save a lot of energy. So let's talk about that. Again, part of the strength of the Boeing company is to take what we've learned on the commercial side and help apply it to our military customers. So Jeppesen is a wholly owned subsidiary of Boeing. We're, along with Tapestry, we, we bought that company uh, a couple of years ago. Very involved in uh, planning for commercial aircraft operations, and tapestry also helps with some uh, military operations. We're taking tools that have been developed to optimize flight planning on the one hand, so that, so that the trajectories and the routes that are flown are the most efficient possible, along with the manifesting of all the various assets, the, the equipment, uh, both the equipment in terms of the airplanes themselves and the equipment in terms of what's being carried on the airplanes. There's a lot of stories from the Air Mobility Command that you know, the, the aircraft would get fully tanked before every flight, and they'd schlep around a whole bunch of equipment that they didn't need. They had a whole, whole lot of uh, sp uh, spares. They had a lot of contingency fuel. And the more weight they carried that they didn't need to carry, the more energy they burned. And, and so they came to Boeing to ask uh, for some lessons learned from our commercial side because they saw the the kind of um, logistics planning and efficiencies that the airlines were operating with, part of it came from um, reserve uh, pilots who worked as airline pilots on their day jobs, and then they came into uh, reserve operations with the Air Force or Naval Aviation, and they saw the incredible waste that, that the government was, was going through. And so partly through those reserve pilots urging they started adopting more and more of the commercial airline practices. So we've been able to help our customers uh, with that. And it's, it's military, so you can see there's plenty of acronyms, U.S. Air Force, USAF, U.S. Navy. VIPSAM is a VIP special air mission for, for there are, there, how many Boeing people are in the, in the audience? Boeing retired or non-retired? A lot of folks, uh, so I'm sure a lot of you are well aware of those acronyms. This is the kind of mission planning software and techniques that, uh, that we've been able to apply for our military customers. And as far as results go, this is an example of helping the UK Royal Mail Service. And, and you can just see the kind of savings 
taking those assets and just doing a little more efficient planning with those assets, a applying some, some linear programming and, and applying some, uh, some of the algorithms that, that we've been able to use with the commercial airlines. 20 million fewer truck miles, $80 million annual savings uh, just for the Royal Mail. So that's an example of the kind of things we're trying to apply across the board to a number of our customers. Boeing has reformed uh, Boeing Energy. We used to have a, a, a division called Boeing Energy when I first joined the company. We have reformed uh, that organization and the focus has been trying to leverage some of the software and techniques that we've been using with our cybersecurity to protect our computing networks and our customers' computing networks and looking at applying that to uh, first the utilities and uh, also our DOD-based customers. There's, there's been a lot of talk about the, the, uh, the issues with uh, viruses and protection of computing networks, but one thing people don't recognize is how vulnerable power systems are. Uh, there was a technician in Arizona about two months ago that flipped the wrong switch, and I know some friends in San Diego with, were without power for two days. There's a lot of vulnerability in our power grid today, and so that's one of the things that we're hoping to to work with both utilities and uh, DoD bases uh, to help them with that with the power security. The other aspect that we're trying to uh, apply some of the lessons learned and some of the analysis techniques that we've got at Boeing, increasingly, uh, especially Western states and New England states have renewable portfolio standards. More and more of our power produced and used in state has to be coming from renewable sources. So that means typically wind and solar. Those are diurnal sources. Quite often, I mean, the wind doesn't blow or produce energy at the peak time when we're using it, for example. So there are issues of, of transmission from these distributed generation sources, and there's issues of storage. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that Denmark has been able to, as a small country, generate a lot of its power from, from wind is that it's very tied into the Scandinavian hydropower network. And so in terms of load leveling, in terms of being able to uh, use uh, shunt excess power to other users, they've been able to really make use of that, the hydro system to help them. That's not true across the United States. And, and so there's a real challenge that a lot of power companies have, Bonneville included, in integrating wind power and distributed systems like wind and solar into the grid. So that's another area uh, helping those utilities with that planning as Boeing, Boeing Energy is uh, attempting to do that. Okay, this is the audience participation point. As a squadron commander, what's the, what's the most efficient, uh, what's the way I can save the most uh, fuel for my squadron? John, John, Some, somebody. I mean, I, I need. Reduce fly time. Reduce fly time. Great, you, you're reading ahead, right? So, okay. <laughs> One of the things we're trying to do at Boeing is, again, leverage what's going on, on the commercial side. On the commercial side, the, the commercial airlines don't spend a lot of time with airliners flying empty doing touch and goes to teach pilots how to fly a 737 or a 767. There's a lot of time those pilots spend in trainers. That's a major cultural shift for fighter pilots. The, 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 whole, uh, the whole culture is, is all about burning holes in the sky. And, and using up that fuel and going on a lot of training missions. And especially in peacetime, most of the fuel used is training missions. One of the things we're trying to do, again, to leverage our lessons learned on the commercial side, is to really help the military with high fidelity training, um, training systems. We haven't quite got to the holodeck version yet, uh, for those Star Trek fans out there, but, but we, are we are getting uh, gaming quality kind of video systems and one of the keys with the military that the commercial guys don't necessarily need is linked multiple pilots multiple systems you know having having a, a squadron of fighters all in the simulators together trying to link their operations so so that's one of the challenges we're trying to help the military with and it saves a tremendous amount of fuel and if we can get a high enough fidelity trainers then the pilots uh, 
I don't know if they can be convinced, but, but they can move further down the path of feeling like they're well-trained without having to burn holes in the sky for all of their, all, all of their training activities. So that's, that's an important aspect, and again, one we're trying to leverage on the commercial side. So I'm going to switch now from talking about more efficient uses of energy to how we generate energy. And this is an area that Boeing is, uh, has got some history and heritage in, and we hope to have even more going forward. So we'll talk about some of these topics here. First, uh, uh, a general background. Boeing has a lot of heritage history, especially after the late 70s, after the, after the Arab oil embargo, during the Jimmy Carter era, Department of Energy was formed. There was a lot of effort and activity going to aerospace companies uh, asking for solutions for alternative energy. So when I joined the Boeing company in 1981, we had a Boeing energy company. We made the world's biggest wind turbines. Uh, I remember going to uh, Block Island in, uh, off the shore of Rhode Island, and, and there was one of the big Boeing wind turbines uh, producing power there. There was one on uh, several in, on the Hawaiian Islands. Um, we had a lot of uh, 767 engineers that came down from the 767 program and went on the Mod, the Mod 5 program. Our heritage companies, Rockwell and McDonnell Douglas down in Southern California, we worked on wind up here. Well, they worked on solar down there. I, I think it's probably a better, better fit. Working on solar up, up here in Puget Sound would probably have been less effective. So they, they worked a lot of uh, successful systems uh, of solar energy, both solar thermal and so, solar photovoltaic down in the deserts in California. We, uh, Boeing Company, a lot of people don't know it, but we managed the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for the government. Uh, we had a coal gasification. Uh, there's a great Boeing picture with a, with a Boeing-labeled truck uh, with what looks like a, a still from Appalachia sitting on the back. It's a, it's a coal-fired uh, gasification plant to run the car, very similar to what the Germans used in World War II when they were cut off from the oil, from the oil fields and they had to use coal. So we've got a, a variety of history with all of our heritage companies in many of these areas. Uh, some of those uh, have ended, of course, because after the peak of oil, then the oil came down in price. It wasn't economic. The, the, uh, a lot of the customers found cheaper oil to be uh, all that they needed, and, we, and a lot of the renewable energy programs uh, were ended in the 90s. Uh, but we're seeing a resurgence of those, clearly. One of the things that many people don't realize is when we bought Hughes satellites, we also bought the Spectrolab company. And, and Spectrolab, most of the satellites in orbit today have Spectrolab solar cells on them. So, so the company does nothing more than make solar cells down in Silmar, California. Uh, recently, the last eight or nine years uh, since, since uh, joining Boeing, we've invested in uh, some facilities down there to not just make uh, spacecraft solar cells, but also to apply some of that technology to make uh, terrestrial cells for use in, in very high, high efficiency concentrators. And so uh, Spectrolab, and, and I'll show you a, a simple little chart here in a second, Spectrolab holds uh, numerous records for having the most f uh, efficient solar cells in the business right now. This is an example of the impact. Uh, this is a multi-junction. What, what we did was here's a eight-unit uh, concentrator, solar concentrator uh, um, facility down in Australia. And what, what, what they did was at each of the at the focus of each of these uh, antennas or reflectors is a silicon silicon cell-based receiver that that uh, converts the uh, solar energy to electrical energy. We replaced one of those silicon receivers with a multi-junction uh, Spectrolab cell, and you can see that one was about 33% efficient. It doubled the output uh, by doing nothing more than replacing the kind of cell that was in that, in that assembly. So it, it has tremendous impacts, uh, and the, uh, the multi-junction cells, they're, they're expensive, and they need these kind of uh, reflectors to really operate. Uh, for example, that we've built uh, under the Solar America contract for the Department of Energy, we've built modules, panels of modules that are about this big, 
that concentrate uh, up to 600 suns onto a single solar cell about the size of your thumbnail. So the expensive part is that thumbnail sized piece of gallium and arsenide and multi-layer solar cell. But if you can get four or 500 suns uh, focused on it, it can be as much as 43% efficient. So it's a tremendous improvement uh, from an efficiency standpoint. Now this next chart is one that the people that reviewed my presentation told me never use. So uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I understand why, because for me, I mean, I, I, I tend to embrace my inner nerd. And it's a very simple chart. You know, the, the message of the chart is that things are getting better, right? Uh, so back in the 70s, the best we could do was about 15% efficient for a fuel cell. And today, the Spectre Lab cells for those concentrators are about, we broke through the 43% efficiency uh, boundary. Now, the colors obviously are important. So the, the top lines, the most efficient, are those that are multi-junction. They need, they need focused sunlight to get through the various layers and to make use, full use of the whole spectrum of sunlight. Um, for those of you that saw Mary Armstrong's presentation, she showed you the, the, uh, the new assembly facility for 787 down in Charleston. Uh, we're rolling out, like tar paper, solar cells that cover the roof of that facility in Charleston. It's going to produce 15% of the, the building's uh, energy. That is clearly not the 43% uh, uh, concentrating photovoltaic cell system. That's, that's the thin film technology that you see down there in green. So you're still, you're still in uh, you know, pretty good 16 to 20% efficiencies with those kind of cells. Different cells for different applications. We couldn't, we couldn't put the concentrators in Charleston because there's, a, there's building codes and hurricane restrictions that, that uh, those kind of systems just don't tolerate. The concentrators tend to be uh, uh, in bands closer to the equator from about, say, American Southwest, uh, where you have a high level of incidence down in th into the tropics. So, that's, so the different cells for different purposes, different locations. But the good news is that uh, with uh, all the effort that's been invested over the years, we're slowly, as you can see, really improving the efficiency of these systems and improving the diversity of all the different systems so that depending on your application, there's probably a, a system out there that, that uh, works for you, even in Seattle. Next topic is fuel cells. Uh, so I've been, I just celebrated my 30th anniversary with Boeing, and, and fuel cells have been, have been uh, like 20 years away for the last 20 years. It's just, it's one of those challenges that there's a lot of technology, from an efficiency standpoint, they, they make a lot of sense. Uh, they're very quiet, they generate a lot less CO2, uh, produce water as a byproduct. Uh, there's wide applications for them. But there are some technical challenges and hurdles that, that need to be overcome. This is uh, a, um, a powered glider that uh, our, our research and technology uh, facility in, in Madrid, Spain, converted, took out the, the uh, engine, put in an electric motor and a fuel cell, as well as a battery. The battery is used for takeoff energy, and then the fuel cell provides all the power for a straight and level flight. So this was a flight that we did in 2008. Um, I was going to show you the video of it, but it's kind of boring. It's straight and level flight. You know, it takes off, motor glider. I, you know, I'd rather show you hydrogen-powered phantom eyes. But uh, so, so we are slowly trying to generate time and history and experience with a number of these fuel cell systems. The challenges of fuel cells, when, when you use hydrogen as a fuel, like we're going to use with phantom I mean, one of the one of the potentials for phantom I, for example, is to replace that Ford truck engine with three turbochargers, eventually with with a fuel cell. And uh, when you've got hydrogen, it's a very clean fuel to go into a fuel cell, and you've still got some water management because you want to pull off water at the same rate that you're generating it. There's some other balance issues. Uh, but more often than not, the fuel you're using is going to be natural gas or jet fuel or kerosene or diesel. And those fuels as inputs have, um, have a lot of impurities. Uh, they've got 
materials like sulfur that will, that will kill the catalyst in a fuel cell. So there, there's pretreatment to fuels that, that we haven't quite got right yet, but we're still working on to make these fuel cells uh, efficient. So proton exchange um, membrane, the polymer electrolyte, that's the, that's the PEM fuel cell. That's the technology that, that we're working with today. That's what flew in Madrid. The HT PEM is a high temperature. PEM, the SOFC is a solid oxide fuel cell. And there's, there's a number of other different chemistries and different kinds of fuel cells. Uh, some have the, the positive ion movement. Some have the negative ion movement. Each has positive benefits or negative benefits from a temperature standpoint. But we're looking at gradually, you can see the different horizons and implementation across the top, gradually uh, using wider and wider, making wider and wider use of these fuel cells to provide more and more of the power uh, on aircraft because it is a very efficient uh, way of producing power. So fuel cells are the future. We'll just hopefully keep working on them until we get it right. Another uh, thing that's very exciting that we're doing down at our South Park facility is uh, looking at advanced flywheels for energy storage. There's some, some very uh, impressive applications, especially military applications, for uh, these advanced flywheels comp when compared to batteries or even fuel cells. We'll talk about those in a second. But this is a, a notional idea of... Uh, um, having an electric vehicle powered by fuel cells. One of the people asked me if I bought my Prius yet, being uh, the director for uh, lowering the environmental footprint for the BDS side of Boeing. And I haven't yet, partly because I've got a car that's probably got a good 10 more years of life in it. But um, one of the challenges that's hold me back is we've got those batteries that have got 10 years of life in, in uh, a Civic Hybrid or, or a Prius or something. And then what do you do with the batteries when you're done with them? Then you've got to replace uh, a major portion. If we have electromechanical device for electrical storage, like these flywheels, uh, that, that's good for the life of the car. It allows you to do quick charging and uh, provides, uh, provides a lot of benefits from an environmental impact point of view if we can get it right. So this is a technology that we just won another Department of Energy uh, award uh, to to productize some of this uh, flywheel technology. And if you look at comparisons, where we are today is a graphite composite flywheel. Uh, there's two aspects. One is the rotor, getting a lightweight rotor that's got all of its weight out at the periphery to, to maximize uh, your inertia. And one is the bearing system. And so you can see as we're looking at technology and comparing with advanced fuel cells, right now the kind of uh, solid oxide fuel cell that we hope to put into that Vulture uh, aircraft that we talked about is in the two to 300 uh, kilowatt or watt hour per kilogram kind of range. So up in the less than five years, uh, we hope to have that thing flying in, in by 2014. The flywheels are keeping pace with them and flywheels kind of have different applications too. So let's talk about those for a second. When you compare flywheels with batteries, one of the challenges with today's flywheels are the, is the resistance in the bearing. So whether it's a mechanical bearing or even an a electrical mechanical bearing, after four, five, six days, you're going to drain the power out of that flywheel because of the resistance and the gradual slowing down of the wheel. One of the things that, that we're leveraging, uh, we're leveraging some uh, centrifuge work that we've done for Oak Ridge National Lab for uh, uh, for them is uh, the superconducting, using superconducting materials that provides very low energy levitation uh, to provide a, essentially a friction free bearing for spinning at very high, high speeds. And so we've got uh, in the lab and in demonstration models some of these flywheels that have got, that use these superconducting super materials to provide friction free bearings. And that's key because Flywheels have some real advantages with some military systems that we're looking at supporting. For example, there are, uh, there are laser avengers where we're looking at, at uh, systems that need big power spike outputs uh, where batteries just wouldn't be able to provide or fuel cells wouldn't be able to provide the kind of spikes that we're looking at. The other advantage of flywheels is just as they can have big output spikes, you can spin them up quickly. You don't have to have a multi-hour battery charge time frame. So 
there's some pro, there's some uh, real advantages that flywheels as a storage technique can can bring, and we're we've got a number of patents in this area from our previous work that we're hoping to capitalize on. The last thing uh, that I was going to touch on was some of the work that we're doing with renewable fuel cells. I mean, with uh, renewable fuels, specifically biofuels. Um, the Boeing company is investing most of their energy in biofuels to help our commercial airline customers. The prime motivation for biofuels for Boeing, uh, the airlines are facing increasing number of emission trading scheme, uh, carbon taxes as they fly in and out of Europe, for example. Uh, the, the carbon output of aviation is, uh, has got more visibility than Boeing Company would like. And so we would definitely like to try and help our commercial airline customers lower the carbon, uh, the carbon output of our jets. The Boeing Company is not the least bit interested in getting involved in the commodity business. We do not want to become an oil refiner or a biofuel refiner. But we are interested in helping uh, the airlines and now increasingly the DOD to look at um, Carb, lower carbon fuels when you look at the life cycle uh, of those fuels. The military really got a wake-up call in 2008 when you see this, the, the spike in fuel because what they had to do is they had to stop buying aircraft and transfer that money that year to their operational budget to buy more fuel because the fuel price that uh, the Defense Logistics Agency was paying uh, to buy fuel on the market, as you can see, went up... Uh, tremendously to $180 a barrel uh, at, at the peak. So, so source diversity, fuel price uh, diversity, energy security to a lesser extent, you know, uh, um, th there's talk uh, mostly by politicians of we need to produce biofuels so we're independent of the Persian Gulf. But, you know, oil is a fungible commodity. And, and the, last, the last user uh, that's going to be cut off is the U.S. military. I mean, we're, we're, we will fund... Uh, our defense before we, uh, uh, before we fund uh, other, other needs of, of oil, I'm sure, if, if push came to shove. But the, the notion of um, additional diversity and, and being able to, to provide some price uh, leverage is something that, that the military is attracted to. As far as what we're doing and, and how you do this, we've, uh, we've helped become a catalyst for getting um, feedstock providers together with oil refiners, with catalyst makers to, to help uh, get approval for the first pathway, it's called, to take uh, oil seeds and animal fats and tallow uh, and turn it into jet fuel. It's called hydroprocessing. We just chained, we, we were able after two years of testing uh, to to change the jet fuel spec to allow use of hydroprocessed fats, oils, and uh, um, biosources. In order to make biofuel work, it's going to be dependent on the, the underlying price of whatever commodity we use to convert. So we have to make sure that we're not trading food for fuel. There's a, there, are a lot of, um, there are a lot of bad uh, examples when Europe first got into biofuels, they, uh, they like palm oil, so people cut down Indonesian rainforests and planted palm trees to get palm oil. Wrong motivation there. I mean, just bad, bad outcome for that. We saw the same kind of thing in the U.S. with the support of corn for ethanol, uh, affecting corn prices, and uh, there's a lot of concern with food for fuel. So what we're trying to do at Boeing is essentially work fuel certification, to, to allow the pathways to prove that it can be made into good jet fuel that meets all the specifications. And we're working with uh, international organizations for renewable biofuels to make sure that it, it is truly sustainable, that we're not trading food for, fu food for fuel, that we're trying to use waste products like, like animal tallow. One, one of the, um, well, today it was announced Alaska is flying uh, the f one of the flights to D.C. and one of the f Horizon flights uh, using Bombardier down to uh, Portland are going to be using biofuel sourced from uh, the first refinery that's making jet fuel from, from biosources, and that's sponsored by Tyson's. You can imagine what source they're using for that down in Arkansas. 
So it's chicken fat and it's uh, restaurant grease, and that's what we're converting that would otherwise be waste, go into landfills. Uh, we're using Alaska's buying that fuel for, uh, for their test flight or for their revenue flights that start this week, started today, I think. So that's the first pathway that, that we have certified. The next pathway, actually, it's uh, very topical for this group because University of Washington was announced today, won this international award, right, for a group of students, came up with some enzymes that they feed bugs that they can convert sugars to, uh, to diesel in this case, but it's a short step to, to kerosene for jet fuel. That, that sugar to jet fuel is the next pathway that ASTM, the international organization for jet fuel is going to be uh, working to certify and we're in the middle of uh, uh, helping, helping them do that. Um, so there's a number of initiatives that, that Boeing, especially Boeing Commercial Airline, is, uh, is pioneering and trying to get together. We've got an MOU we're announcing today or tomorrow, you might get advance notice of this, uh, in Hawaii to work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and, and the U.S. Navy to take some biomass uh, waste in Hawaii to convert it to jet fuel. So number of projects all over the globe, the same biomass isn't, isn't useful in Abu Dhabi as it is uh, in Hawaii or as it is in Arkansas. So you got to find a bunch of different sources to really get the price down to make it an effective uh, source of jet fuel. So. Uh, as far as the uh, progress report goes, we've got the first round of approval. That happened a couple months ago. Uh, we're working together with the Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy, and the DOD uh, to help uh, lower the barriers and help a lot of these other pathways get certified. So that's a quick survey of a number of technologies that we're hoping to insert uh, into our products to help uh, the U.S. government uh, address uh, some of their energy efficiency uh, concerns. And uh, thanks for your time, and I welcome any questions that you've got. Tim, thank you. I'll start with a couple, Tim. Question, why do biofuels have less carbon content? Well, when you convert it to jet fuel, and put it in and burn it through a jet engine, it's got the very same carbon output because it's jet fuel. It's chemically identical to jet fuel once it goes in the tanks, once it comes out of the refinery. Uh, and in fact, what we hope um, in a few years, now that it's certified, you won't know what's in the pipeline uh, from the time it leaves the refinery. So from that point on, it's identical with jet fuel. What biofuel is counting on to be a lower carbon fuel is rather than taking petroleum, which has been underground sequestered for millennia from a carbon standpoint, and pulling it up and turning it into uh, jet fuel, we're taking plants or uh, plants and animals, and which during their growing cycle pull carbon out of the air and sequester it temporarily in, in their uh, cells. And then we take those cells and turn it into jet fuel. So rather than take something that's sequestered and turn it and release it into the environment, we're taking something that's already in the environment, pulling it out, and putting it back in. So that's, that's the notion of uh, why biofuel can be carbon neutral or even carbon beneficial. It's complex, though, because it's all about land use changes, too. If you, if you cut down a forest, like they did with palm oil, in order to plant things that will grow biofuel feedstock, then, then you've just cut down a forest, which is pulling a lot of carbon out of the air. So we have to be very careful that, that the pathways we choose are sustainable. Otherwise, they're not legitimately carbon neutral. Our next question. Regarding hydrogen specifically, to what degree does the production of hydrogen as a fuel dilute the green effect of this fuel? That's a good question. So uh, a lot of hydrogen is made from natural gas. Uh, that's uh, um, it's a question of, I think, of the energy balance and how much energy it takes to convert the, that natural gas, which would be released and burned, into hydrogen. So I, I don't have the uh, um, precise uh, balance number, but I know hydrogen as a fuel is very efficient. And that's, what they're, that's one of the reasons that, that, uh, that we're looking at using that. Tim, thank you. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you.